Hello everyone, we are back for part three of module one. So this is gonna be a shorter last section to our module uh, where you should have watched already part one and part two. And we're gonna continue our discussion of looking at how we can measure pressure. We ended last, um, last part with uh, a statement that we can measure pressure difference with a fluid column. And what does that actually mean? So if we write the equation down that we had written at the end of the last part, we see that delta Z is equal to delta P over rho G. And rho is density, G is gravity, and delta Z is our change in height. And if we apply it to a column of water and what a column of water is or a column of fluid is just a container with some fluid and this fluid has a certain height within that container. Now, let's say we were trying to find our pressure at this point right here. So we're trying to find pressure at this point right here. Okay, and we have, we know that we have pressure atmospheric at the surface. So this is some liquid here, we have some liquid, or we can also call it a fluid, just to be more general. So it's a liquid fluid. And we're trying to find our pressure at this point, which we can call pressure two, for example. And Pressure two is at a certain height h below the surface of the water. So how can we find our how can we find our pressure? Well, from the height we can actually find our pressure. So from the height we can say that pressure two, if pressure two is absolute. Okay, so we had looked at absolute pressure earlier in the lectures. So pressure to absolute is equal to P atmospheric plus the pressure gauge, the pressure read at the gauge. And what we know is we already know P atmospheric, so P atmospheric is there. And we can say that P gauge is equal to rho g times delta z, which can also be written in our case. Since we know our delta z is h in this case, we can write it as rho g h. So we now have an equation for pressure gauge. And then from pressure gauge, we can then find pressure two, which would be the absolute pressure. Okay, another way of looking at this is essentially, if we know the change in height of the fluid, if we know this, we can find delta P because rho and G are constant. These two are constant. Okay, if you have the same fluid, they're going to be constant. So rho and g are going to be constant, our density is going to be constant, our gravity is going to be constant. And if we know delta z, we can rearrange the equation to find delta p. And essentially, delta p is equal to p gauge. That's pretty much what we're saying in this specific case right here. Okay. Now, other ways to measure pressure. Uh, let's look at some common examples of how to measure pressure. So to measure pressure, we can use something called a manometer. So a manometer looks something like this. So it measures, this measures pressure in terms 
of the height of the liquid. Okay, and a manometer looks something like this. Let's say we have a gas. Okay, and this gas is connected through a tube to the atmosphere. But between this atmosphere, we're actually gonna have, and let me change that a little bit so that it's more accurate. So we could have a gas that looks something like this. And so we have this gas and this gas, which we'll highlight in blue, this gas is going to be going all through here. And then we're going to have a liquid or a fluid. We're going to have a fluid, which is going to be in color orange. We're going to have a fluid in here. So this is our fluid, which is going to sort of act as a barrier between our gas and our air, which is going to be out here. Okay. So essentially we have right here, we have pressure atmospheric. This is the atmosphere. This is the outside. Okay. And this gas is trapped within this, um, container and there's a fluid blocking the gas from getting out, but the fluid is there to actually measure the pressure. So if we look at this, we can actually see that in our case, to measure the pressure, we have a difference in height between the fluid on the right side and the fluid on the left side. This is a height H. We're going to call this a height H. And we're going to call this point P1 and this point P2. And if we redraw this just by itself, okay, without the actual gas container, we have the pressure from the gas coming here and the pressure from the atmosphere coming into here. And they're essentially fighting with each other and and essentially counteracting each other. Now, what would happen if we had, what would happen if we had, so let me just draw this again. What would happen if we had the same drawing and we now had our pressure of gas and pressure atmosphere, the fluid level would be the same. So we have pressure atmosphere here and pressure gas coming into here. If it's the same level, the pressure of the gas is equal to pressure of the atmosphere. Okay. If the fluid is at exactly the same level, we should have the exact same pressure. Now, in our example above, we see that there's a difference in height between atmospheric pressure and pressure at point two. So which one do you think has the higher pressure? Try to think about it. The one that has the higher pressure is the one that pushes the fluid more down. So pressure point two has a higher pressure than point one. So let's try and write an equation for this. So if we try and write an equation for this, we can say that pressure two is equal to P atmosphere plus the pressure that it's pushing the fluid through this height H. So the pressure that it's pushing the fluid through this height H and this height is essentially P atmospheric. Oh, sorry. Let me just write P atmospheric plus rho GH. 
Okay, we know that the difference in height and pressure can be written as rho gh. If P2 height is the same as P1 height, we know that essentially rho gh would be equal to zero. Okay, so if P2 height and P1 height are the same, just like in our example on the right, we know that rho gh is equal to zero. Okay, so that's a really easy way to figure out what's happening. And from there, we can also write that P2 in the same way as before is equal to P atmospheric plus P gauge essentially. Okay, so it's P atmospheric plus P gauge. Okay, let's look at a barometer now. So let's look at a different system called a barometer for pressure measurement. So how does a barometer work? So again, we're not gonna be using a lot of pressure principles uh, in detail in this class. However, we will be using pressure a lot. So understanding these pressure principles is important so as to understand what's happening and what we can do. So a barometer, what it does is it measures, the goal of the barometer is to measure P atmosphere. So it's not there to measure anything else but the pressure atmosphere and actually getting a number for the pressure of atmosphere. Okay, and how a barometer is designed is it's essentially a beaker or some container which has some level of fluid and we'll talk about what the fluid is and you then have an inverted an inverted test tube that would be put into this system and up here you would have a certain height to that fluid and so essentially what it looks like is something like this. So you know that we have, so we always have, whenever we're exposed to the outside, we have pressure atmosphere pushing down on a fluid. And the pressure atmosphere is pushing down on the fluid. And in here, we actually purposefully create a vacuum. So we create a vacuum that where we know we have a vacuum and then we just apply pressure atmosphere to the fluid. And this fluid is in green, we can show it in green, is gonna be pushed up all the way here because it's gonna be pushed higher because the vacuum doesn't put any pressure back. Okay, by using a vacuum in that little area at the top, we actually are able to measure pressure atmosphere directly from rho g h. And the height h is the height between here and the top of the fluid. So we're able to use rho g h because we essentially have p atmosphere and we know that rho g h measures a difference in pressure it's p atmosphere minus p vacuum what is the pressure vacuum if we have a vacuum what is the pressure in a vacuum the pressure is equal to zero so this goes to zero and we have that this is equal to rho g H. And the fluid that they usually use for barometers is mercury. And so we sometimes measure the actual pressure in the atmosphere in millimeters of mercury. So instead of instead of writing the pressure as one atmosphere or one bar or 1.3 bar or something like that, 
we usually write it, we can also write it as 760 millimeters of mercury. And this depends on the day, right? So one day it might be 760, one day it might be 765. But the accepted value is that one atmosphere is usually around 760 millimeters of mercury. So essentially when you apply atmospheric pressure to mercury versus a pressure with a vacuum, you usually get uh, you usually get a, pr uh, a height difference here, which is equal to 760 millimeters whenever you use mercury for that. Okay, so pretty interesting um, way of measuring just atmospheric pressure by allowing one side to be a vacuum and to be completely empty and therefore creating a pressure of zero on one side of our equation so we can find the difference in height. Okay, moving on from this, the next thing I want to talk about is Pascal's law. Which we will use a little bit in this course, especially to understand what's happening and how it works in terms of the pressure. But Pascal's law, what it says is the pressure applied to a confined fluid increases the pressure throughout by the same amount. So the pressure, and I'll write pressure as P, and let me zoom out a little bit so that we're back to normal zoom. So the pressure applied to a confined fluid increases the pressure throughout by the same amount. And what does that mean? Let's look at an example of this because I think it makes more sense to look at an actual example. So let's say we have a system, again, a system with two piston cylinders and the two piston cylinders are connected through this channel with some fluid. And we have one piston on one side and another bigger piston on the other side. Okay, so we have two pistons and we're trying to see how a pressure would would affect one side with the other. So what Pascal's law is saying is that if we have a pressure one here and a pressure two here, pressure one is going to be equal to pressure two. So what it's saying is if we apply pressure one, for example, let's apply a force this way. So let's apply force one over this area one. Okay, this is an, a certain area. And then we have an area two here. We would have a force two going up. Okay, what Pascal's law is saying is that Force two and force one are not going to be the same, but pressure one and pressure two are going to be the same. And since we can say that pressure one and pressure two is equal to the same thing, we remember that pressure is equal to force over area. And that means that we can rearrange this equation to write F1 over A1 is equal to F2, sorry, not P2. F2 over A2. And rearranges this equation a little bit further, we can say that F2 over F1 is equal to A2 over A1. And so we can see that the difference in the difference in forces is actually the difference in forces or the multiple of forces is directly related to the area. Okay, so if area two is bigger than area one, force two is going to be greater than force one. However, 
pressure one and pressure two stay the same. Okay, the pressure is, is translated directly throughout the whole fluid and is the same throughout the whole fluid based on that initial force that was put through. Okay, and that's really important to understand. And the reason we can assume that is because we assume that our fluid is uniform and is going to translate all the pressure uniformly throughout. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about today and for this specific part of our lecture is the concept of temperature and what temperature actually means. So let's move on to this is our sort of introduction to introduction to um, pressure. And now we're going to go into our temperature and what temperature means as a whole, because we need to understand what temperature means as well. So we looked at volume, specific volume, we looked at pressure, and now we're finally going to be looking at temperature. And what it actually means. Okay, so how did temperature originate originally? What does temperature mean? What is temperature? Someone will tell me, oh, it's the degrees that it feels outside. Well, actually, the temperature and its concept actually were derived from perceptions. So the concept of temperature originates from perception of hot or cold. So this perception is like feeling hot or feeling cold. And we decided to put numbers on that feeling hot or feeling cold. So if we feel hot, we put a certain number to it. If we feel cold, we feel um, we, we put a certain number to it. And temperature really can't be defined by itself. It's very hard to define what temperature is, except for it feels like 90 degrees and we know what it feels like, but what does it mean on a chemical level? What does it mean in terms of what's happening? We can't really put a number on it or we can't really measure it very easily. We have to measure it from other things. So, it's easier to define equality of temperature than temperature. So I'll just write it down. So easier to define equality of temperature, and I'll write temp, than to define temperature itself. So let's assume that we have two blocks of copper. So let's take an example. We have two blocks of copper. And those two blocks of copper, there's going to be one hot block of copper and one cold. And I'll draw them out below here. We have a hot and a cold block. All right, hot and cold. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring them into contact and isolate them from their sur from its surroundings. So we're going to bring into contact and isolate from the surroundings. So essentially, we're going to have these two connected to each other. So we're going to connect them to each other. And we're also going to create this box which is going to isolate them from the surroundings. Now, try to think of what happens if we put a hot and a cold block together. So what happens is obviously we, we know that we reach some sort of equal temperature over time, right? That's our assumption. But why do we do why do we know that? How do we know what's going to happen? So, can we measure how it's going to be changing temperature? How can we measure that? So, one way of doing this 
is to look at the two blocks. So I'll put back hot and cold. And what can we specifically measure except for temperature, which we know how to measure with, with an instrument, but we don't really know how to measure it otherwise. How would you measure the changes that are happening when you put a hot and cold block together? Well, you can actually say that we can measure the following things. So what's going to happen to the hot block? If we look at the block in itself, we know the temperature is going to go down just from experience. But what else is going to be happening? We can say that the volume of that block is going to go down ever so slightly, but it's going to go down. And we can also say that the electrical resistance, which is a measurable thing, also goes down. And conversely, the volume and the electrical resistance on the cold block are going to increase. Okay, this is what we can measure. And eventually, since it's the same material, the volume and the electrical resistance, so V plus ER, are the same. So eventually, they're all the same, and it's reached some sort of equilibrium. We call this equilibrium thermal equilibrium. So thermal equilibrium means that the temperature is the same between the two. And how do we measure thermal equilibrium? We measure thermal equilibrium from the same physical properties that the two blocks have. So if the blocks have the same physical properties, we can therefore say that they are in thermal equilibrium and we can therefore say that they have the same temperature. So you see that it's actually a lot harder to think about temperature and how to measure it if we don't have a thermometer. Okay, if we don't have a thermometer, how do we measure the difference in pressure? We have to look at the volume of that block and the electrical resistance of that block and maybe other properties as well pressure, volume, all these different things can be measured uh, through that. Now, the zeroth law of thermodynamics, which was found after the first and second law, and this is why it's called the zeroth law of thermodynamics, and it wasn't really found, it was stated by someone. So the zeroth law of thermodynamics says says that when two bodies have equality of temperature with a third body they in turn have equality of temperature with each other so what it says and I'm going to write it down just so that we have it it's also in your textbook if you want to but when two bodies have equality of temperature with a third body, we can say that they in turn have equality of temperature with each other. 
So what does that mean? Essentially, what we can say is it can be restated as replace a third body with a, with a thermometer. If two, thermo, if two bodies are in thermal equilibrium and if they both have the same temperature reading, even if they're not in contact, they're going to have the same temperature. Okay, so essentially our third body is the idea of adding a thermometer to the two, the two bodies that are there. So the two pieces of copper, the hot and cold, once they come to equilibrium, if we put a thermometer against one and then a thermometer against the other, if they both have the same reading compared to the thermometer, they essentially are in thermal equilibrium. And this can occur also when they're not touching. So if we measure the temperature of water in one place and water in another place, and they have the same temperature as a thermometer, then we know that they're all the same temperature. So this law is essentially the basis for temperature measurement. And it cannot be derived from any other law. So it precedes the first and second law because we need it to understand better what the first and second law are, which we'll go through this class. This class is about the first and second law of thermodynamics. So again, this is the law that is the basis for temperature and how to measure temperature. Okay. And what the zeroth law does is it allows us to put a scale it allows us to put a scale on a thermometer. And if you want to read more about this, you can definitely read more about it in, um, in your textbook. But essentially what we're saying is that if we have two bodies and we need to figure out if they're in thermal equilibrium or not, if we attach a thermometer here and then attach a thermometer here, the same thermometer, if this thermometer reads 20 degrees Celsius and this thermometer reads 20 degrees Celsius and they're the same thermometer, then everything is at 20 degrees Celsius and everything is in thermal equilibrium. If there's a different reading on that third body, then between the two blocks, then they're not in thermal equilibrium. They have different temperatures. And this zeroth law allows us to put numbers to temperature, but these numbers are arbitrary. And they can, it cannot be derived from any other law. So this law cannot be derived. It's sort of a statement that we make and that statement has always been shown as true. Okay, so it's a true statement, but we can't, we can't derive it from anything else. Now, quick notes on temperature. Uh, we know there's four main scales. And in this class, we're going to focus on two, but we have Celsius. So degrees Celsius. We have Fahrenheit. And we have Kelvin and Rankine. And we're going to be using mostly these two in this class. So Celsius, how was Celsius defined? So Celsius originally defined its scale by saying, all right, let's base it on two points. Let's, be let's base temperature on two points that we know. And two points that we know are always going to be the same and are always going to show the same thing on our thermometer. And what they did is they said, let's look at the ice point for water. And let's look at the steam point for water. And we all know that the ice point and the steam point 
are 0 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. This is not always the case, but at a standard one atmosphere for saturated air, it usually works out to be 0 and 100 degrees. And this is how the scale was created. So what they did is they made an experiment. They had ice and they brought a thermometer to here. And what does a thermometer actually do? What does a mercury thermometer actually do? How does it read temperature? It reads temperature by looking at the volume expansion of mercury. So usually it's mercury, but you can use other fluids too. But it looks at the volume expansion of mercury to measure temperature. So what, how did they do it? What they would do is they had ice water or ice essentially, and they would bring in contact some mercury with some ice. And they had the mercury tank with the thermometer. So they had mercury in here, surrounded by ice, okay, or ice water, that's at ice temperature. And the mercury would get to a certain level and they would label that level zero degrees Celsius. And then they took the same exact measuring tool and they put it in boiling water. And in the boiling water, the level, so I won't draw the whole thing, but the level reached here. And so they would label a hundred degrees Celsius. Okay, if they had the two tools, so let me just draw the tool again so that we have it mercury and this is not to scale it's just an example okay and they would see that the mercury level would go higher to 100 degrees celsius so now they had a basis as to how to measure from 0 to 100 so they knew that this was a linear scale from 0 to 100 and now they had their scale on their thermometer and now they could use that to measure other things. And then when they put it on our skin, for example, it hit 37.2 degrees. So that's how they did it. Okay, that's the example of how they came up with the thermometer. So pretty interesting. Now, Kelvin is an absolute scale. So once they figured out that they could do zero to 100 degrees, they wanted to figure out how to get to the lowest level possible. And the lowest level possible is when no particles are moving. And this happens to be the Kelvin scale. So zero Kelvin is absolute zero. And Kelvin is converted from Celsius as Celsius plus 273.15 Kelvin. Okay, or 273.15, I guess. We can just write it like that. And in this class, you can use 273. You don't have to use 273.15. But essentially, ice water would be at 273.15 Kelvin would be equivalent to zero degrees Celsius. And in turn, 373.15 Kelvin would be equal to 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, just to give you an idea. And the idea of the Fahrenheit and Rankine is sort of the same thing, just with a different scale. Okay, so if you want to read more about temperature, you can definitely read more about it. But that's the basic concept of temperature. And this basic concept will become very important when we start talking about entropy in the last uh, module for the class. So this concludes uh, our module one uh, introduction and basic concepts lecture series. Uh, so it's three lectures. This is the third lecture. This is the final lecture. And this is really an introduction for the class and will be used uh, throughout the class to sort of build upon this knowledge. And in module two, we're going to be we're going to have some uh, study problems that we're going to do. And this module one will really help to set up that basis for module two. So next, you'll be going into m module two. Uh, where you'll be watching some lectures on, on properties of pure substances. So we'll pick up on that in module two.